How are you all doing? It is time for a Q&A, the first one of 2022. And um, I'll tell you what, there's been loads of questions, more than I can probably answer in this video, unless I do them super, super quick, but there's just 55 that submitted on YouTube alone. I asked people on Instagram, on YouTube, and on Twitter. So I'll get through as many as I can. And what's amazing is I did two of these last year and there are questions submitted this time round. Well, actually all of them are pretty much ones I haven't answered before. So, and they're all ones I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into. So let's get started. So I'm gonna answer your questions as I walk around the glorious Wanstead Flats. Well, the, the first one is from my old pal, Udal. We used to work together many moons ago. Um, he says, Ho hope you're well. I'm very well, thanks Udal. Apologies if this has already been asked, but what is your favorite film about London? Take it easy. Well, actually it hasn't been asked before. Not a film about London. People have asked my favorite film set in London. My favorite film about London is called London <laughs> by Patrick Keeler. And it's an amazing film. You'd have heard me mention it before in previous videos. And actually I did one of the walks that Keeler's character undertakes in the film. And it's an incredible film. Um, it was shot in 1992. So it has the IRA bomb going off in Bishopsgate. It has the general election of 92. This kind of big events, which are just coincidental. It really captures early 90s London better than any film I've ever seen. And it's really like a thesis film that explores the idea of the problem of London. And the person posing this question is a character called Robinson, who we never see, nor do we see the narrator. And the film opens with the narrator returning to London on a cruise ship, which is where he works. And it opens with the line, a journey to the end of the world. It's got great music. The narration is all done by the brilliant Paul Schofield. It's incredible. And the film's structured around three expeditions exploring this idea of the problem of London. And, and for Robinson, part of the problem of London is that uh, it was, I think there's a wonderful line where he talks about it being an urban city ruled by a sub-urban government. And the, the, basically the psychology of the people in charge of running London or the political class was people who had a fear of cities and of Europe. And I did a wonderful Q&A with Patrick Keeler when the book version of London was released and uh, we, we, I asked him a number of questions about whether the problem of London still exists and the changing nature of the problem of London and uh, I will link to that below but highly recommend that film if you love these videos you will adore that film probably stylistically very different but one of the nicest things everyone's ever said about my filmmaking when I first made my very first YouTube videos 2006 Ian Sinclair described it as grunge keeler and uh, I used that as my kind of tagline for many years. Thanks, Udell, for a great question. If I take as long to answer all the questions, this video is going to be about two days long. So uh, this, is from, this is from Raj. This is a funny one. Some of you may be able to answer this better than me. And he says, uh, a walk I'd like to do one day, and you may find it interesting, is to visit all 20 Weatherspoons pubs in London. What do you think, John? This is uh, zone one. There's 20 Weatherspoons <laughs> pubs in zone one, which makes it walkable if you still walk towards it. 20, no, <laughs> I would never want to do that. How many weather spoons would I want to go to in a day? I mean, the ones in zone one, actually, there are some amazing ones like Hamilton Hall at Liverpool Street. And there's the one down near the Tower of London. They are incredible pubs and incredible buildings. But then some of them are like the one in Charing Cross Road, whatever that's it, the Moon Underwater. Not a great pub, that one. That used to be the mar one version of the Marquee Club. But good luck to you, Raj. Let me know if you do it. Hi, John, big fan. I know I shouldn't read that bit out because it's like I'm bigging myself up, but that's a really lovely thing for someone to say. I would still love to see you walk more of the southern side of the Thames, Gravesend, Higham, Grain, etc. That's definitely on the agenda for this summer. In fact, I hope to go down to some of that territory in June with a friend of mine who knows a lot about that, Professor Kate Spencer. You'd have seen her last year on the River Wandle Walk. And the second question is, will you write another book one day? I'm glad you've asked. I have written another book and I am going to self-publish it this summer. I hope to publish it in September. I can't see any reason not to publish it in September. It's written, it's finished. Um, I'm gonna actually add a little bit more text to it to the end. Uh, so there's one more chapter to write, but um, yeah, I've spoken to somebody who knows about how to do all this stuff. And yeah, 
so it needs to come out this year it sort of it starts the year after the olympics ends so there are some kind of post-olympic reflections if you like about what happened in london immediately after the uh, olympics and the impact but then it goes beyond far beyond that and it's a book that i've been working on since 2013 and that I, that I love. And um, I'm gonna be really excited, really excited to be finally putting it out there into the world. So you'll be hearing more about that book between now and then. And obviously you'll be hearing, that's all I'll talk about <laughs> from, from, from when it's published. You'll be sick of it. By Christmas, you'll have had enough. And that was a question, by the way, from Dan. Simona asks, do you believe in certain places being haunted or retaining some past stories? Well, yeah, kind of, in a way. I mean, it depends what you mean by haunted. Certainly places retain atmospheres and uh, they definitely, you know, this is a part of the idea of psychogeography in us, you know, the, the way that places make you feel. And it's very basic meaning, very basic meaning sort of human animal reaction to environments and places and buildings. I, do, I think do contain stories and memories and they do give off a certain kind of ambience. In fact, when I was in Berlin, I picked up a book called um, The uh, Ghosts of Berlin. It's a fantastic book. And there's a quote in there, which I will quote now, actually. He says, memories often cleave to the physical settings of events. That is why buildings and places have so many stories to tell. They give form to a city's history and identity. That's from uh, Ghosts of Berlin by Brian Ladd. And I completely, completely um, agree with that sentiment. And I think you see that in the videos, hopefully. Jason asks, what's your favorite part of Britain that you always look forward to returning to? That's a really good question. There's two answers, I'm afraid. One is the area where I grew up, in Buckinghamshire, around High Wycom. Always look forward to going there. That's pretty obvious, so that's a bit of a, a cop -hour. Suffolk, I love Suffolk. The family loves Suffolk. We first uh, went on holiday to Southwold, I think, nearly 10 years ago now, nine years ago. And we try and go other places, but we just end up going back to Suffolk. And I've done a couple of uh, videos there. You'll have seen Southwold, uh, Orford Ness just last year, uh, also Woodbridge and Sutton Hoo, Rendlesham Forest, all that. I really do feel a strong uh, kind of draw to Suffolk. I love it there. It's a really beautiful county. Any more plans to, uh, for walks in Europe? Loved your Berlin trip. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be really good. Um, yeah, I'm going to go back to Paris at some point in the next couple of months. I haven't been to Paris for, for a while. I went on a kind of like a work trip a few years ago, but that was just a day going over there. We filmed an interview, came home, and that's what we did both times. But Paris is one of those places, isn't it, that you can just pass through it like that. And yet it still is a massive experience. So I want to go back for just a couple of days and hopefully make a video. There is a video on another channel I started years ago just to put video, little uh, video snippets on my blog. And I made a video, a very short video there. And I used some audio of my wife reading from Walter Benjamin's Arcades projects as we walk through the Paris Arcades at night. I'll link to that below. This is a great question from Archie. Fantastic, and one that I've never been asked before. I mean, I've never been asked any of them, but you know, this one particularly is a good one. Uh, in your opinion, what's the most underrated part of London and equally most overrated? Fantastic question, Archie. Thank you for asking. Because it also gives me a chance to plug the book you could buy right now, This Other London, Adventures in the Overlook City. I know most of you actually have, have bought that book, haven't you? Thank you very much. And the premise of This Other London really was that idea that actually, although we only really kind of celebrate and talk about very few areas of London, all the kind of outer suburbs of London, the unheralded, overlooked parts of London, also have amazing stories. And they're, they're equal, equal heritage to the places that we, we talk about and celebrate. Whatever level you want to look at it, whether you're talking about uh, ancient history, whether you're talking about Roman history, whether you're talking about palaces and castles and battlefields, whether you're talking about literary associations or popular cultural associations, you'll find as many of them in Ryslip as you will in Westminster. So um, I would say all the places in my book, This Other London, I think are chronically underrated. However, that is not in the spirit of this q and I think Archie deserves an answer. So if I had to pick one place, it has to be a place that I feel like I know quite well and I feel is desperately underrated. And I'd say that's Chingford. 
Uh, and I, the reason I picked Chingford partly is it's underrated even by the people that live in Waltham Forest. <laughs> even the people that live in the same borough go to just uh, Chingford. It's one of those places that people sort of slightly turn their nose up and sneer at. And I think that's the classic thing. The underrated parts of London, people kind of feel, they feel they've got permission to kind of go, ugh, that place, you know. And I feel that Chingford gets quite a bit of that. But, you know, Chingford's an amazing place. It's right on the, on the edge of the rump of Epping Forest, like where we are here. We've got these spindly bits of Epping Forest, but Chingford sits on Chingford Plain, the corner of Chingford Plain, the real gateway to London's wilderness. It's incredible, you've got Pole Hill at Chingford, which is one end of the original Greenwich Meridian. Greenwich, Greenwich, the place we all celebrate. Well, the other end of that Greenwich Meridian that measures time was on Pole Hill, Chingford. That's amazing, there's an obelisk there and everything that you can go and visit. Why isn't that a major tourist destination? I do not know. You've got Queen Elizabeth's Hunting Lodge, which is actually Henry VIII's Hunting Lodge. It's older than Queen Elizabeth I, it's incredible. Um, I really like Chingford High Street, it's kind of quirky and natty. Going to Chingford is a little bit like time travel, it's like going back to the 1950s in a way. Um, it's just got so many things to recommend it. It sits on a, on a hill overlooking the River Lee, so you can drop down off Chingford High Street, down into the River Lee, and you can see got these incredible views across London. It's, a, I think so, I think it's horribly, it's horribly, um, underrated. You've got the story of sirloin steak, I like that one, that has its origins in Chingford, lots of other things like that. Most overrated is a bit more, that's a bit more difficult, isn't it? Because I wouldn't want to kind of, you know, do the same thing and turn my nose up at somewhere, but I'm going to have to, and I'm going to say it's probably Shoreditch, actually. I think if you were somebody who was a traveller to London, you'd have heard, oh yeah, Shoreditch is great, great trendy place to go. It's all right, it's okay, I don't mind. Shoreditch is where it's kind of my first experiences in London. A lot of them are around there when I was a student at City Poly. I don't think it's amazing though. I don't think, you know, I think if you were coming to London from overseas, you know, you don't have to go to Shoreditch. You know, you know if you're looking for a great night out, it's sort of, or yeah, you can have a decent night out. It isn't what it was. It isn't what it was 20, 25 years ago. It was had a more of a vibe to it then than it does now. And I, but I still think it's, kind of kept its reputation that was kind of gleaned in the sort of in the mid 90s late 90s early noughties and it hasn't been updated to where it's now a sort of annex of the city in a way probably <laughs> that's gonna that's gonna that might get a strong response there probably are other places but i think the other places that are highly rated like camden is still camden it's still great Hampstead is still Hampstead. it's got the heath it's still got that slightly natty bohemian air to it although it's losing it soho they've done a lot to change Soho, but it's still fantastic islington's always going to be great you know what i mean like, it's difficult brixton's incredible i don't know yeah i'm trying to think of other places that I, you could fall, you know you could ask are they overrated but no it's going to be shortage some questions from my wonderful supporters on patreon um have you considered a book of photographs? Uh, do you know of the work of Bernard or Hill, uh, Hiller Becker or Stephen Gill? Stephen Gill I've heard of. He did a wonderful book of photographs um, around the Lee Valley. I think it was called Archaeology in Reverse. And um, Ian Sinclair wrote an article about it uh, in The Guardian. Um, uh, but I've never actually seen the book. I think it's really hard to get hold of. Hiller Becker I have heard of, actually. Somebody suggested a few years ago to do a book of photographs. And I did one for myself to test the idea but I never took it any further than that. I, I like the suggestion. I'm flattered by the suggestion, to be honest with you. Thank you for that, Lee. Um, Linda Sue asked a really good question. I'm, actually, even now, I don't know what the answer is. Have you ever done a walk that is person-specific? And the only one that comes to mind really directly is uh, the, the ones that are based on books. So, um, so I, we did a, uh, a walk, I did a walk with Bob and Roberta Smith tracing the footsteps of the character Austerlitz from the book Austerlitz by W.G. Sebold. When we did that walk from uh, Liverpool Street to Stepney. Um, and although that really is person specific, it's a person in a, in a book though. Likewise, Rings of Saturn doesn't really count. And the other one would be again, London, the walk in London, because it's a journey undertaken by a character. But other than that, I don't think I have actually. So that's really intriguing. That will probably, that will probably, um, make me yeah that'll probably elicit some further thought i think and arnfin says um 
This is a recently finished Rachel Liechtenstein Stella Estuary, and I'm recommending Nick Papadimitrio's Scarp to anyone who will listen. Both excellent books, and both lovely people as well. Uh, do you have any recommendations for good psychogeographical books in print, London or otherwise? Um, I'm a very boring answer for you, actually. And I'm going to say um, they're going to be anything by Ian Sinclair that it's not, not his novels, obviously, but any of his, well, actually, Dan River's a novel, isn't it? And that's a, a good recommendation. So any Ian Sinclair, <laughs> um, I would say, apart from maybe the ones in America, but then again, he did say not London specific. Any Ian Sinclair, aside from Ian Sinclair, I think, um, hmm, I have to think about that. I'll put them on the screen if I can think of any others. There are others, but they're a bit more oblique. Some people say The Rings of Saturn by W.G. Sebold. I'm not so sure I put that in the, in the category of psychogeography, to be honest with you, but there are some others. Well, I just can't think of one right now. I like this question, actually. <laughs> I've probably put more thought into the answer to this question than any of the others. What's the place to get a good pint right on the River Thames in the summer? Tim. Now, that's interesting because... I, I don't really drink on, right on the table. I mean, it's a hard thing to do. In London, if I had to take someone to a pub I've been to before, right on the Thames, I'd probably be um, down at Hammersmith, near Hammersmith Bridge. I think it's called, what's it called? I've written it down, actually. It's the Blue Anchor. Uh, that's a good pub uh, on the Thames. Although any Thameside pub in London is going to get rammed in the summer. Um, my, probably my favourite, to be honest with you, and to get a good pint. Is the, um, is the Angel down at Henley on Henley Bridge. And when I was a kid, I used to love going there in the summer, particularly on Regatta Day, you'd go down there and it was like a festival. Well, I suppose it was a festival, wasn't it, Regatta, Rome Festival. But you know, all the young kids, well, I was like 16, 17, 18, it was amazing. And everyone would be around the Angel. And the Angel was still there, it's right on Henley Bridge. It's, it's surprisingly not busy, actually. I went there with my family a couple of years ago and, um, yeah, it wasn't too bad, even though it was a really beautiful day. And you've got the, and the bounty, the bounty down at Bourne End. You have to get a boat across there. I don't know, you can drive around. Maybe I only ever went there on a boat because I knew people had boats. In London, you've got the Prospect to Whitby, but I think the problem with the Prospect to Whitby, really, is just that balcony bit, isn't it? So chances of getting out there on a nice summer's day. Do you want to know a little secret, though? If you wanted to have a drink overlooking the Thames, that surprisingly few people know you can do is if you go to the National Theatre, you can just get a drink from one of the National Theatre bars and take it out onto the and take it out onto the balcony there. You just have a drink over the terrace. It's really beautiful, and often those terraces on the National Theatre, there's no one up there or very few people. I used to take friends up there. If you were having a you know, meeting on a Friday night, you want to have a sit down and have a chat and a nice drink. Great place to go. I like this question actually. This is a question from, I didn't, did I write the name? I think this is from Joe. I'll correct that if that's incorrect. Have you considered or even hiked one of the America's great hiking trails, the PCT, CDT, or the Appalachian? Um, I haven't, <laughs> short answer. But uh, it's really quite tied to this channel in some ways, or the evolution of this channel. Very early on in the process of doing regular walking videos. and. The, you know, the original premise, actually, I had the original idea to do a regular, what I call a walking vlog, when I was walking across here, actually, across Wanstead Flats. And I had the idea, and I vi videoed myself talking about the idea that I would, at that point, I thought I'd do one daily, and just be my lo local walks after I dropped the kids off at school, and I would just go and do a walk wherever, and I would just capture simple observations about my local area. and be like a kind of, you know, a walking video diary, walking vlog. And I recorded the video and sent it to my sister, so almost to hold me accountable. And the videos sort of evolved over that. I gave up the idea of doing them daily after the first week. <laughs> and I tried to do them weekly from there. It was a little bit more difficult in those days than it is now. Um, but then when doing one of those little local walks over here, I walked to Ilford, went in the waterstones at Ilford and bought a copy of Bill Bryson's book, A Walk in the Woods. And I'd never heard of the Appalachian Trail, I don't think, before then. I read that book, loved it, went on YouTube and discovered there was a whole genre of American hiking videos that people walk these great trails you mentioned and they document them and post the videos online and I became, I wouldn't say addicted, but I would watch those videos every day. I loved them. And that's when I thought, well, actually, I'm going to sort of do more hiking, if you like, on, on this channel here. And I started to go a bit further afield. 
So it did sort of inspire me to go further. Would I want to spend five or six months walking one of those trails? Because like the Appalachian Trail, what's that? 2,000 miles, the PCT is longer. The PCT looks amazing because you, people have to take snowshoes on the one hand and they have to deal with the desert on the other. I mean, the incredible terrain that they cover. Um, no, it doesn't really appeal to me. I tell you, partly why is, you know, like I'm, <laughs> I'm a married man with children. But my kids are getting older now. Like I couldn't leave my wife for that long. And there's no way she'd want to do that. So I think it's a bit extreme. It's a great thing to do. And I think people that do it are, I massively admire them. But um, that's a life, isn't it? And you see from watching that community on YouTube, the, it's a lifestyle for them. It's not just something they do willy nilly. They kind of base their, their year around spending half of it on the trail. Um, but yeah, it's, been a, it's actually been really good for me to have it out there to draw inspiration from it, to draw energy from it as well. Um, I'm still working myself up to do the Ridgeway, so let's do that one first. <laughs> pushing on, pushing on. Here's some from YouTube. Um, given the nature of your walks, are there any areas that you feel neglected or forgotten with the city's push towards gentrification? And conversely, are there any areas that you feel have suffered badly from being gentrified beyond the obvious pricing people out of the neighbourhoods? Uh, uh, it says also, can you do more Canning Town and Custom House, please, from Hippie Mark? Well, Mark, I would have said actually Canning Town and Custom House are those areas that actually probably do feel a little bit neglected and forgotten. Um, particularly as, you know, Newham was one of the Olympic boroughs and you go around there and you go, wow, was it, what did the Olympics cost? Nine billion pounds. And one of the justifications was that it would um, regenerate areas, which is different to uh, gentrify them, regenerate areas, provide work, improve housing, provide more affordable housing, all these things. And one of the things was that that would particularly benefit the lower Lee Valley. And it's difficult to see that in some parts of Newham, for example, you, well, how have these areas directly benefited from the Olympics? This is partly explored in my book, actually. I would say the area where it most, for me, where it most strikes you is Woolwich, where it most struck me when I went there for my book. So admittedly it was t uh, 10 years ago, but I was over there not long ago and I still feel Woolwich feels a bit kind of forgotten and left behind. Likewise, actually, um, North Woolwich has that feel a bit as well. The second part of Mark's question is a bit more, um, a bit more nuanced, if you like. Um, and are there any areas that you feel, um, conversely, are there any areas that feel that have suffered badly from being gentrified beyond the obvious pricing people out of their neighbourhoods? The, the places I think uh, that I've seen, I think you've got, you've see, you see it a bit in, um, I think around sort of Hoxton, actually, is one of the areas there, because there's still a lot of social housing in Hoxton, but so much of it really now is completely been, it's been privatized and then priced out of any recognition and what it's done is i think it's fragment neighborhoods particularly with increasing amounts of property being let out on airbnb on estates and some people i've spoken to said they feel like they're living in a hotel because people are just coming and going the whole time with suitcases um, i don't know whether the pandemic's kind of changed that a bit gentrification itself needn't always be negative and let's remember as well it's been going on for a long time like you could say it's been, it's been going on for over 100 years. It's, it's really the development that sometimes follows gentrification. Sometimes gentrification is just like, like, like the taster tape for the tower blocks to come, the, side, you know, the investment silos in the sky. That's the stuff that's particularly negative and really has a kind of detrimental effect on, on um, a lot of areas of London. You see that particularly around the fringes of Islington. Again, you see it in Bermondsey. I don't think I answered that very well. <laughs> I'll say that now. Swordfish K2 has asked, uh, you seem to enjoy your Essex coastal walks from Burnham on Crouch. I certainly did. I loved them. They were fantastic. I really love my Essex coastal walks. Uh, have you considered doing the whole of the Essex coast in stages? Mercy Island is well worth a visit. And um, try all Sea Island and North Island. Yes, I would love to go to those places. In fact, a friend of mine has said he's going to take me to one of them. I think Mercy Island. And so that's imminent. That'll happen hopefully over the summer. Uh, have I thought about walking the whole Essex coast in what in stages honestly no um that, i know people do that as a thing it's it never really occurred to me because it would take up so much time as well i mean i could do it in stages over over um a period of years but you know, i'm quite happy to cherry pick the bits i'm going to walk around it's a quick one to answer 
John, may seem an odd question, but knowing you're an avid uh, train user, do you drive to any of your further afield walks? No, because I don't drive. I've never learned to drive. Would you ever consider walking the whole of the Thames path across the whole of London? Uh, not really. Again, I've been walking bits of the Thames path in stages. Somebody said you don't seem to have done many walks along the River Thames. Uh, I'll put a playlist below to something like 15 Thames walks, I think. Uh, but no, not really. I don't know why. Probably because I grew up very close to the Thames, um, so a lot of it is very familiar to me, actually. Uh, what are your thoughts? This is a good question. What are your thoughts on opening up the culverted rivers? Do you think this would be a good idea to make the city a better place to live in? Are there any initiatives or plans for this? Thanks, Yolanda. Uh, it's called daylighting, I believe, that, that process of opening up the culverted rivers. Um, funnily enough, the Higham Hillbrook, which I made a video about is it last year or the year before? Time has become so strange now, hasn't it? Uh, that's been daylighted in the section through a new development, funnily enough. Do I think it would be a good idea? Yeah, I think wherever possible. I mean, I know it's not realistic, say, for example, to open up the whole of the River Fleet because it runs through a, a massively kind of um, urbanised area. And in a lot of cases, the, you know, there's roads over it. But I think any opportunities to open up the culverted rivers should be, should be grasped. And it flummoxes me when you see developments which pass over the culverted rivers where there is an opportunity to, 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 to daylight them, to bring them back to the surface, like the Woolbrook, uh, where it's near the, is it the Bloomberg building? That would have been amazing to have had a section of it running through there. I would have thought that would have been too difficult to do. And there's numerous other developments as well where you think there is an opportunity here to daylight the river and it isn't taken. So I think it should be something that's on development plans maybe. Bring them back, people would love it. A question I frequently get asked um, in the comments actually of each video, so it's good for me to be able to answer it here once and for all. Someone said, uh, is the background music specially written for your vlogs? I think it complements the visuals perfectly. No, the music that I use in the videos comes from uh, one of two sources. It comes from the YouTube audio library, and um, so you can just, anyone can use the music from the YouTube audio library. And uh, I get it from Epidemic Sounds, which is a subscription service uh, that I pay money for and you can use. There's a catalogue of thousands of songs uh, that are great, really, really good quality um, soundtrack music. And I always put the, um, the links, oh, not the links, but I always put the listing of the music I've used in the video description. So if you watch a video, you go, oh, that was a really nice song, I wonder what that was. If you go down into the video description, you'll see a list of all the tracks that I've used. I really love this bit of Wanstead Flats over here. I can't find the actual question, but somebody asked me why I always film this shot of me walking away from the camera. Because you look, we know you walk alone, we don't need to see that. Well, for me, it helps give the idea of, A, I'm doing a walk. You can see the idea, oh, look, yeah, here's a person walking. And it, I, I like the rhythm of it. I like the way that spatially it opens the video out and conveys that idea of we are in this landscape having this experience. I like to try and make these walks, these videos a kind of immersive thing if possible. And that's uh, one way of doing it. It gives you a break from either looking at my face or the cutaways of the landscape. Hope that makes sense. If I can find the actual question, I'll pop it down here below. I'm skipping over a few questions that I've been asked in previous Q&As, so, and I'll just give you an example. It's like, if I could live in another er era of London, which would it be? Yeah, there's a few, um, yeah, there's about three or four. So excuse me, if you ask one of those questions, uh, if you go back to the <laughs> previous Q&A videos, you'll find it answered. The era in London, uh, just after the Romans left. I'd love to see the city of London just after the Romans left. It'd be amazing. Deserted city. Um, so, uh, this is a good one. Um, will you ever get around to walking the whole of the New River? Um, either as a single day or a multi-day uh, multi hike. I talk about it all the time, don't I? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. It'll be this summer. And I'm saying it again. I'm going to do it this summer. I think a single day would be a bit much to film it because it's 29 miles. And although I have done a 32-mile walk up the River Lee. I did start from home, so I didn't have any travel. So, yes, I don't know. But that is still the plan. Maybe I'll do it over two days this summer. 
hold me to account on that. Um, Ali asked a good question, which I, I can answer with, with some videos. Um, what's your favourite bit of London that you uh, that is tucked away and not really seen? Just think of all the alleyways and little squares set off main streets. Well, probably only known to those living there or gets overlooked. Um, I don't have a single favourite, but I really love the kind of alleyways and courtyards and little secret gardens of the city of London. And I have been exploring some of that in a video series on the churches of the city of London, but a lot of those walks do take in these little places, these little old churchyards from churches that were either bombed or just demolished over the years or burnt down the Great Fire and were never rebuilt. The uh, Catherine Grindeer Memorial Garden place that I went to a couple, just a couple of weeks ago actually is one of those. Um, but there are places in the city of London and there's, there's so many of them and I love it because it really opens out that medieval street plan. It gives you a, that sense of old, old London. Hi John, quick question. Will you ever make it to the source of the River Lee? Do you know what? When I read that question um, this morning, I thought, actually, I'm going to do that tomorrow. I have my plans to do a walk tomorrow, so I don't like to change those plans. But I do think, actually, that would be an amazing thing to do tomorrow. And now I'm saying this to you now, I do think, actually, maybe, <laughs> maybe I will do that tomorrow. I was going to go to the coast tomorrow. I really felt like getting out of London to the coast. So if I went to the source of the River Lee, I'd be going in the opposite direction up towards, well, not, as I say, in the direction of the Midlands. I think Luton might be at the bottom of the Midland Plain. I'm sure geographers and geologists will know the answer to that. I like ones where I can answer and say, I'll link to a video below. Um, besides Shooters Hill, have you been around Welling and Bexley Heath on your adventures? Actually, I haven't been around Welling and Bexley Heath. I misread the question. Uh, not much to see apparently aside from William Morris's Red House. Well, I'd like to see William Morris's Red House. So that goes on the list. Thank you very much for that yummy banana fish. Uh, have you, when walking and filming continuously, do you only select certain areas to record? I'm doing it right now, aren't I? Um, so it depends, well, there's certain areas well, where I will try to avoid recording for practical reasons. And if it's really noisy and I know that I'm not gonna be in that area for long, I'll avoid it. Um, Likewise, I was going to say like really crowded areas like high streets and such, but you'll have seen recently I film in high streets all the time. It depends on the nature of the high street. When I was walking through central Brixton recently, I filmed continuously throughout central Brixton and in places like the arcades and stuff um, because you sort of feel like in Brixton, no one's going to care. <laughs> no, one's going to, no one's even going to notice really. Um, it's not the kind of place where people are going to go, oh, what on earth is he doing around? Um, whereas maybe somewhere uh, outside London and more of a provincial kind of high street or something, I might maybe avoid walking down the high street holding my camera out in front of me like this. Um, but yeah, if it's really noisy, I will, I'll try to avoid filming there, unless I'm going to be walking down a road for a while. And likewise, if there's music playing in the background, <laughs> sounds silly, but I can't use that audio because YouTube will think I'm using commercial music and they could copyright strike my video. There you go. Brandon from uh, Dallas, Texas, is asking me a question which I have been asked before and I have answered it, but I think, uh, A, I really like Brandon's comments. He comments on every video, so I feel like I should answer Brandon's question. Um, and yes, I've done it, but since I answered that question last, I have followed up and I have done videos in other cities in the UK and in Europe, like Berlin recently, Barnstable at the beginning of the year, and also, <laughs> I'm struggling to remember the other one that I did. Oxford, I went to Oxford as well. So I've already done three in other cities this year and I will do more. I mean, I, want, I keep mentioning that Sheffield is one I want to do. Uh, Norwich is another one. Yeah, so there will be, I would say, conservatively, expect at least two or three other UK cities. But I also like to get out into the countryside and the coastal areas as well beyond London. So I, I think going forward, I'd probably like to get to a, a position where maybe 40% of the videos are outside London. That would include obviously the London hinterland. So some people may not think of like parts of Essex as being outside London, but it certainly feels that way to me when you go out there. Someone's asking me about a video I asked. Um, sorry, I should read it out properly. Um, it's Annie said, I remember you uh, ending a video in Welling not long ago. Do you know what, Annie? I think that was four or five years ago, actually. Any chance you might branch out for a ramble to the Garden Cities or better, uh, yet the post-war Newtowns? 
Favourite YouTube channel, John? Ah, oh, I hope I bump into you one day on a footpath somewhere. I hope so too, Annie. And if any of you ever do see me around, come up and say hello. People do it all the time and I really enjoy it. It's lovely to meet people who watch the videos. Um, yeah, do you know what's interesting? One of my um, book proposals in the period of time I was writing my new book, I was still kind of occasionally going to meet publishers to talk about ideas. And one of the ideas I came up with, which seemed really viable for a commercial publisher, I'm not going to say what it is actually, because I still might do it. But anyway, it did include um, some of the garden cities in it. It's not about garden cities, nor is it about new towns. I think both of those subjects have been covered in books. I might be wrong. But all I say is there's something in those places which was of interest to me. So, yeah, I did some research around some of the other Hertfordshire garden cities. And um, I really got excited about going there. Uh, new towns. Yeah, I want to go to Basildon. Do something in Basildon. That could be a good one, wouldn't it? Basildon. And I've already... I haven't really done much of Harlow. I've walked through Harlow. So maybe Harlow is another good one as well. I can't pronounce their YouTube name, but it, uh, they, they say, um, what's the function of the large carabiner on your backpack strap? Which is interesting, isn't it? Because you wouldn't know because I'm usually holding my camera. It's where I hang my camera. So I hang my camera off that strap. I'm using uh, my action camera, actually, the DJI Osmo, because I'm walking and talking all the time. The other one is, uh, you know, it's a lot tighter on my face. So you wouldn't want, this video is going to be at least half an hour long. You don't want my, my you don't want that for half an hour, do you? So this one's got a much wider field of view, but it, there's no strap on it. So this became slightly redundant, uh, but I didn't take it off for some reason, but no, it's where I hang my camera. Great question that I enjoy answering. I might have answered it in some form before, but um, hey, John, uh, your videos inspired me to find out more walks. Really enjoyed your Barnstable walk, uh, as I know North Devon very well. Just wondering how long you've lived in the London area and what inspired you to take these walks? I'm guessing nature and human nature. Um, I've lived in the London area. Well, I moved to London from uh, the sort of High Wycombe area here when I was 18. I'm going to give away my age. Who cares, eh? Um, so I lived, I'm just because I've broken it up with time abroad, that's all. So I, I first moved to London uh, 33 years ago. That's when I first moved to London. But I have lived in other countries for some of that time and spent time traveling. So I guess, it's, I, I don't know, sort of. Uh, over 25 years I suppose um, but yeah it, it turned from beginning to end it's like 33 years uh, and I've yeah I mean it's the greatest place on earth <laughs> for me for me I don't believe in league tables of greatest places uh, I think that's facile everywhere's great if you love where you are that's the greatest place on earth and I find London endlessly fascinating which partly answers your next question um, but really the simple explanation for why these videos why um, the book, This Other London, was, and my explorations of London, even when I wasn't making a video or writing a book or putting on a blog, was, you know, I spent a chunk of my 20s backpacking and traveling and, and really loving that lifestyle, really loving psychologically what it did to me, this idea of looking at the world as a world of wonder and exploration, and that there's always something incredible around the corner. And when I kind of, in inverted commas, settled down in London or decided to stay here, with my wife when um, we were having our first child, I realized actually I could still carry on traveling, but in London, that I didn't have to give up that sense of wonder and exploration because you'll never completely know London. There's a, there's a Jeff Nicholson novel where a guy tries to walk every page and every square of the A to Z. I mean, I think it takes him his entire, entire life. And of course, what would happen is areas you walked at the beginning of that journey will have changed by the time you get to the end. So you'll never know every corner of London. And it's one of the things that makes it one of the most fascinating cities on earth. It's what inspires me to keep going out and exploring more. But it is very simply, you know, I've never wanted to give up that part of me that put a backpack on when I was, well, how old was I, 23, and went on a plane from Heathrow for the very first time my very first flight was to Thailand to start exploring. And I remember waking up that first morning in the youth hostel in Bangkok and going out on the rooftop and going, I could go anywhere today. I could get another plane and go to Vietnam. I can do anything. And it was, it was mind blowing. And you, yeah, I, I think it's the thing that's been fueling me ever since. This is a question I don't know how to answer, but I feel like I have to pose it. And I should know the answer, but um, it's Woodside Walker said, if you had to recommend one London walk to a visitor, 
which would it be and why? That's such a difficult question to answer. And I suppose it depends by, when you say a walk, because um, that implies there'd be some sort of trail, I guess, that you could follow. If you could only do one London walk, which would it be and why? And I would say um, it would probably be, oh, I'm going to say the River Fleet. I'm going to say because of the different ambiences that you would experience. And that's why it's a great walk, because it takes you from Hampstead Heath. And you get a view of London from Hampstead Heath, so you see the whole city out beneath you. And then you walk through lots of different kind of uh, territories and terrains. You get a shift in ambiences and it takes you through King's Cross. Obviously, you're going to go, you go through Kentish Town um, and then down through the back streets around the sort of the bottom of Islington, if you like. I know it's not in Islington, but you know, the bottom of the hill, the plain where William Blake saw pillars of gold, takes you through there, through King's Cross, and then down through kind of uh, that, that really kind of where well, it is the London Borough of Islington, isn't it? You know, uh, beneath Percy Circus and that bit there. And then you go down um, Farringdon Road underneath the Holborn Viaduct and down to the Thames. And I just think if you had to do one manageable walk of about, mm, it's not long, it's about six or seven miles, um, that would be one which just reveals so much about London and its past. But then again, I sort of feel like a walk that doesn't take in Soho, for example, is not really showing you London. So I feel like this needs proper plotting and planning. You could walk the Tyburn, no, not the Tyburn, you see? It's going to go on and on. I think the fact there aren't easy questions, easy answers to these questions shows you a lot about the complex nature of London. I love this question from um, Martin Steele, actually, and it's great. I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure about the answer, but he says, which London venue would you say was the best for seeing bands from your 20s onwards? Also, which was the most memorable band? That's a great question. And do you know what? I think this is, you know, is this the most accurate answer? I don't know, but the one that comes straight away to mind was um, I saw ultra vivid scene at the borderline just off Chancross Road and it would have been I think 92, 93 and that it was an incredible gig partly because I wasn't really expecting a great deal I only really knew one of their songs um, they'd had a sort of indie hit with a song called The Mercy Seat and the borderline's a small venue it's a small place and they just took the roof off it it was in, the, the noise was incredible and it was just you just felt it in every part of your body and that was an incredible gig. My mate was um, guitar teching for them. That's why I went. I sort of just went on a freebie on a guest list. And then we had uh, a drink with them afterwards. And it was just like, wow, oh, that, was, that was one of the most memorable gigs from that period of my life. Other than that, I tended to go to places like, um, went to the Forum a lot, where it's called the Town and Country Club there. I saw Oasis there at the, uh, the Town and Country Club. That would have been 92, 93. That was one of those sort of like early... London gigs just just before their first album came out. That was pretty incredible. So yeah, I think I'm gonna say the Boardline. I went to a few other gigs at the Boardline there. Small, small, really small venue. But they used to have amazing bands there. Um, other than that, I used to go to like big places like I saw. A memorable gig was there. It was a tour called Roller Coaster that had, listen to this, it had these bands ro used to rotate the order. It was the Jesus and Mary Chain, Dinosaur Junior, Blur and My Bloody Valentine, all doing an equal length set, and uh, they yes, yeah, so they rotate the headline. And I saw that at Brixton Academy, and that would have been I think 93, 93, 94. It was amazing. Blur had just released released uh, Modern Life is Rubbish, so they were the kind of like the bottom. They were the least popular band of the of the four at the time, and the other bands I just never forget. I never forget the sound. My Bloody Valentine were incredible, and Jesus and Mary Chain were immense as well. Um, and Blur actually it was a bit of a mess. Blur. <laughs> they had a brass section and everything, and it didn't quite didn't quite work. And Dinosaur Junior were insane; just played at like triple speed to play as many songs as possible within the half hour set. That was that was an incredible gig. Brixton Academy is always always a great experience, actually. Although it's a big venue, it's probably the my favourite of the big venues. It's not a very exciting answer that one, is it? But that's just the truth. Possibly the last question. <laughs> You'll know because you know the length of the video. I don't know how long this video is going to be, obviously, until I edit it, but I have a feeling, given the length of some of my answers, it's going to be really quite long. I've got a friend who's convinced that I can't give a succinct answer to a question, and um, which I can test vigorously that I can give a concise answer to a question. 
Uh, unfortunately, this video is ample evidence that uh, she is sadly correct. Um, this is a, but this is an interesting question. And uh, Mark the Pondering Man asks, do any of your walks get abandoned for whatever reason and the video is never shown? It's only happened once, actually. And that was when I spontaneously got off a bus as it was passing the Regent's Canal and went, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to film a walk along the Regent's Canal. And I started and I didn't get very far, but I shot probably, I don't know, like the first few minutes of a video of what then my videos used to be about seven to 10 minutes long. So probably 30% of a video. And I just wasn't feeling it. And I just thought, do you know what? I'm not enjoying this. And I abandoned it. And I don't know if I've even looked at that footage. And it's quite a few years ago now, but that's the only time, the only one. So thank you so much for all those questions. And I haven't answered every single one of them, but I'm pretty sure the ones that I haven't answered, I have answered in some form previously, or some of the questions were, were duplicated. There were probably about five or six questions about gentrification. There was a great question about what socks I wear. <laughs> I think they're called Urban Knit, actually. I buy them from TK Maxx, they're great. Um, and there was a question about the camera I use. It's not the one I'm filming this one. I use an Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II. I'll put the name on the screen. It's a fantastic camera. It ticks all my boxes uh, and I love it very much. Um, also like this DJI, but I don't really use it anymore, apart from things like this. And so that was it. Um, favorite parts of London, favorite walks, all those, they've all been answered before in other videos. Can I, people join me on a walk, group walks, all that kind of thing. Answered in previous videos or is out there, the information's there maybe on my blog. The Lost Byway, I always put that on the end credits of every video. Thank you so much. If you've got to the end of this video, wow, like you're, you really are my, my hero. And um, thank you so much for tuning in every week to watch the videos and I really appreciate you taking the time to to ask these questions those that I haven't replied to in here I will try and write an answer to them and as I always like to say I look forward to seeing you on the next walk wherever that may be and before I filmed this I would have been pretty sure I knew where it was going to be in fact I did know and now there is a slither of doubt about that